So I'm going to go ahead and get us started with some introductions and a few additional announcements while we wait for a few more people to arrive. And that way we won't take any time away from you, Mitch, talking about your wonderful new book. Um, but I'll go ahead and introduce myself. And for those who don't know me, my name is Beth Novak, and I'm the director of the Governance Lab based in NYU and also a senior fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge. Together we host this Future of Democracy lecture series. Um, for those who don't know, the Governance Lab is an action research center based at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering, where we focus on uses of technology, data, and innovation to improve how we govern. And we're very delighted to partner with the Institute for Public Knowledge on this series, which, and I'm very glad you're here today because it fits very much within our theme of looking not at uh, the bleak future of democracy that so many of us have predicted, especially on January 6th. But we've been engaged in these talks over the last two years to really try to look at how do we reimagine democracy? How do we rethink democracy? What's the positive future that we want to work towards? Um, and we understand democracy very broadly. So we're going to talk today both about government, about governing, and about democracy in its narrow sense and in its broader sense. Uh, and I'm very delighted to welcome Mitch Weiss here, who is a professor of management practice in the Entrepreneurial Management Unit. And he is also the Richard L. Menschel Faculty Fellow at the Harvard Business School. Um, so he, as we'll talk about today, created and teaches the school's course, a first of its kind program on public entrepreneurship which focuses on public leaders and private entrepreneurs who want to invent and make a difference in the world. And he teaches the entrepreneurial manager in the first year of the MBA program. He has a lot of awards to his name and we'll put his bio in the chat so that you can follow along. I think he's good. You probably met you have many friends here and people who know your bio. Um, but I want to signal out, single out just two things um, that before you went to HBS back in 2014, you were chief of staff and a partner to then Boston Mayor Thomas Menino and helped really to shape what has become known as the uh, new urban mechanics unit, one of the first and most innovative public labs of any city in the world. Um, but it's Boston's Municipal Innovation Strategy Unit um, that has really become the model, I think, that so many other cities and countries have followed. Our own office, the Innovation Office in the state of New Jersey that I work in, um, has really taken new urban mechanics as a model for how we do our own work. And so we're really looking forward to hearing the stories uh, from Boston that have inspired many of the stories in this wonderful new book. And I'm going to um, suggest to people, and Mitch, this is where we're going to switch over to you, and hopefully we can um, spotlight Mitch here and show people, if you would, uh, how they can get a copy of the new book and dive in and talk to you all about it. So why do, just uh, we'll go ahead and start with some questions from me, um, and I'll exercise moderator's prerogative, but then we are already asking you for your questions. We would love to hear from you. Um, so please put your questions in the Q&A and feel free to put comments, introductions, discussion, et cetera, in the chat on the side. So Mitch, welcome. Tell us, why did you decide to write this book and why now? Well, thanks, uh, Beth. It's great to see you, and it's been so fun in, in many ways to do this work, uh, you know, alongside uh, the working government in, in universities. So it's like a real privilege to be here with you, Beth, in particular, and everybody else. Um, I decided to write the book, in many ways, coming out of the experiences you gestured to uh, working for the city of Boston, working for Tom Menino, um, including and most especially uh, working for him on that day in April 2013 when when two bombs uh, were blown up at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. And it was Boston's best day ruined in an instant, uh, two instances, lives upended, uh, three people killed, including an eight-year-old boy, oh, uh, many hundred people wounded. The good thing that started to happen was all this generosity started to flow in from around the world, uh, mostly money, where do we sign it, how do we help? And what normally occurs in those instances is that the big local established institution in town uh, collects and distributes those funds. That's what happened in other disasters, except we knew that that was also um, quite slow. So it had been more than 120 days since the horrible shootings at Sandy Hook. Not a penny had made it yet to the families of those kids. It wasn't going to bring back um, them, but it was meant for their parents. And we knew that our survivors had life-changing decisions to make, urgent decisions to make about limbs, homes, jobs. 
So we decided we would start something new, our own new fund. And uh, the morning after bombings, Beth, um, the head of our local established institution, a very good person, uh, is essentially yelling at me over the telephone while I'm, I'm waiting outside hospital rooms where the mayor's going to visit survivors, saying, you can't start something new. You can't start something new. You'll raise less money. We did. We were up and running that night on a PayPal account the next morning in a post office box. We collected and distributed $60 million in 75 days. Uh, we used all the sort of startup skills and tools we had learned in newer mechanics. Um, and a year later, two survivors asked me to tell them the very long story about how One Fund Boston came to be. And I did, and they said, well, you have to tell that story to other people. And I said, it's not my story to tell. I didn't get hurt. I didn't save anybody's life. That you have to tell the story to others. You have to show people that government can do new things. And so I was left with this question, which is, well, which, which is it really? Is it what the survivors had experienced and benefited from, you know, imperfectly, but benefited from, which was we could, or was it what the foundation per, uh, had had said, and which is, by the way, what most of us also have seen in many instances, which is we can't. And so I had that question in my mind, you know, can we do new things in government anymore? Can we solve other problems? I took that question to Harvard Business School. I built the course that you mentioned. I started, I started investigating this question all around the world. Can we do new things in government? And uh, I came around to this answer, which I, which I ended up writing into the book, uh, which is essentially, yes, if. And the big if is if, uh, if we move on from where we are towards what I end up calling possibility government in the book. So that's a natural segue to wanting to ask you about this whole concept of possibility government. So you talk about the need to shift from a probability government focused on safe solutions and mimicking best practices to this whole idea of possibility government. So maybe you could just lay out for us a little bit what the difference is, what is possibility government um, and how does it differ? I think when I say probability government, I, I mean, doing things that sort of will probably work, but they lead to sort of middling or mediocre outcomes. They're not really, if we're being clear-eyed about it, up to the task. Um, and, I, and, I, I, and I think that has its place, probability government, doing the things that have sort of mostly been done. But I actually think, um, again, if we're being honest about it, it means that we're leaving many problems deeply unsolved. And so I contrast with that possibility government, which is the pursuit of new programs and services, by people in government, by their partners. But by virtue of their novelty, these programs and services are unlikely to work, ergo will only possibly work. <laughs> um, and I, I argue in the book, and I believe deeply, that if we're going to solve real public problems, we need to undertake that mode of government in more instances and in more places. Not, not all the time, but in many instances. And this is the realm um, you know, of, the, of the public entrepreneur. Uh, as you all know, right? So like more than three quarters of new ventures fail. But the ones that succeed are ideally transformative. And, and I, I argue that, that if we're going to solve the big problems of the day, you know, I guess today is infrastructure day, but, but, the, but public health, housing, security, mobility, and equity, that we're going to have to take a possibility mindset uh, towards many more of those things. We are not going to be able to rely on the things that have mostly been done, kind of worked, but don't really solve the problems. We're going to have to try stuff that, um, that's new and so might only possibly work. Let me just, I, I want to get into some stories about this, but let me just ask you the obvious counter argument to this, which is government, of course, is meant to safeguard the taxpayer dollar. Uh, we have a fiduciary duty not to be reckless. We are not meant to fail fast and break things in government. We're meant to fix things in government. Um, and so how do you square that responsibility with this more entrepreneurial, let me call it your, you know, the Harvard Business School mindset uh, <laughs> since you're there, of thinking about government uh, with which this so clearly aligns? Well, I think it's a very fair question. Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, so I'm not out there saying like we should go try and fail on purpose. I'm out there saying basically doing new things, we have to be candid about the uh, prominence of failure, but it's not like we should go out and seek it. Um, but, but look, uh, oftentimes the status quo is actually the dangerous choice. So yes, government is meant to be uh, the backstop in our lives, but when it's failing to, we are obligated therefore to try something new. Yes, uh, government is supposed to be a protector of fiduciary monies, taxpayer monies, but when that money is being spent on things that aren't actually working, it's our responsibility to try things that actually might. So, I, so I, I, the first thing I do when I, when I hear that argument, which is a very fair argument, is say, well, let's be honest about what we're spending the money on now. You know, uh, and I, you, know, you, you know this as, good, as well as anybody, but but, but, but putting out some, you know, uh, 
you know, 500 page RFP for a deliverable to arrive four years from now is not inherently less risky than trying to build, measure, learn our way to a solution in the methods I described in the book. In fact, I'd argue that we're going to spending more money and having a product or a service arrive well after it was needed and with a solution now, which isn't all that responsive to the problem that was at hand. And so I, I just, I think the, the way to counter the argument that this is, this is too risky is to say, no, what we're doing now, <laughs> what we're doing now is, is risky. I mean, there are certainly other, um, uh, other justifications for this, including that actually, if you go back and, and, um, and look over history, government's role has not just been to the stabilizer, it's also been to be the risk taker, the chance taker. I mean, government was invented, right? George Washington says in his first inaugural address, this is an experiment. Four of our first five presidents say this was an experiment. Abraham Lincoln enshrined on the Lincoln Memorial in his second inaugural address says, you know, I will not hazard a prediction about the future. So it's true government has this strain, which is stability and, 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 and certainty, but it's had a strain in the past, which is novelty and the inherent uncertainty. And I'm just arguing we need to recapture at least that, that second strain. Now you wrote this book before COVID, uh, during COVID, before COVID. Uh, is to what extent is this an argument for now? Is this because of COVID, and what we've just been through, or is this born of the the opposite? In other words, not this last year in which we've seen a resurgence of interest in and faith in government because of what government has either been able to do or failed to do during COVID, but at least there's been more attention to government, or is it really born out of the deeper distrust of government that precedes uh, this year? So I wrote the book uh, mainly before, um, uh, but added a, a last chapter, a very important actually last chapter um, um, during. Um, and, uh, and so I think it has uh, absolutely exists sort of pre and post COVID and I'll say why. But I also think it, um, it captures an extremely important lesson we've learned during COVID. So on the first point, it exists pre and post COVID. You know, for me, out of the marathon bombings, we had been all inventive uh, in responding to it with the one fund and otherwise. At the time, I didn't know any of the language of public entrepreneurship. I didn't really know the models of entrepreneurship. We just sort of did some stuff. And it's only in, in then traveling around the world and seeing other people do similar things and seeing the patterns and, under, and going back in the literature and understanding this has existed since uh, you know, people thought about the scientific method and hypothesis-driven entrepreneurship and, um, uh, and public entrepreneurship, you know, Eleanor, Eleanor Ostrom in the 60s and others. So what it did studying this and why I've written it for others is it might give people a language and some frameworks to, to describe what they did in, in COVID to respond so almost instinctually, but to empower them to do it now on other issues, other problems, right? They were so inventive this year. Public entrepreneurs leapt into action. Mayors, governors, public health officials, others didn't think of themselves as inventors. Now they do. And I hope the book will be helpful in giving them a, a way when this is all said and done, whenever that is, uh, to say, oh, I, I understand how I did that and I can do it on other topics. And, and moreover, I hope it'll mean that we don't wait for crises in order to change things. I, I hate the line, you know, crisis is a terrible thing to waste because it implies we should just wait around for the crisis to happen and then make change. We've got to make change before. And so I hope the book exists pre this crisis, pre other crises. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a set of tools and a mindset for responding before the crisis hits. But I will say that COVID did, um, did uh, cause me to add one, I think, really essential argument to the book. After it was done, I went back and added more, which is, which is that we saw people leap to, towards public entrepreneurship, these mayors, these governors, these public health officials, others. And we can be so proud of that. We also saw some other stuff, apathy, finger pointing. Um, and I write about in the book, basically delusion. Like, like we saw some inventiveness, but we also saw you know, hydroxychloroquine and swallowing Lysol and other suggestions. And in looking back on it, I think it's sort of obvious in those two instances why that's not moving from probability to possibility, but moving actually much past it to delusion. But I think if we're being honest, it's not always clear when someone suggests some new thing, whether what it is is possibility or whether what it truly is is delusion. And so in the book, I try to lay out a series of guidelines to help us know. It can't be because you don't like the person's politics. It can't be because the idea is new, because most ideas that are new sound unlikely. We need a way of separating out possibility from delusion. And so looking back on um, 
this whole instance and how people acted, some and others, really caused me to try to lay out, well, actually, how would we know, how we know the difference? So I'm eager to push you now for more of these stories. I mean, not the hydroxychloroquine stories. Uh, we, we are glad to have those in the rearview mirror, but I think it would really help us to understand what you see as being the best exemplars of possibility government. And we have the great fortune that you are uh, not just a theorist, but a practitioner who has done so much work, not just in Boston, but through um, coaching and teaching that you've done uh, at Harvard for mayors around the country and, and frankly around the world, would love to hear what you're seeing that really for you is the exemplar of possibility government. Um, and we'll get in a moment to the question of how we institutionalize it, but what does it look like in terms of some of the best stories? So some stuff that's alive right now that, I, that I'm really um, hopeful about and interested in, like, again, none of these things will probably work because they're still right new. But I write in the book uh, about, um, about a company called Biobot Analytics, uh, founded by two women, Mariana Matus, Nusha Gailey out of MIT. You may know them. Um, and um, their original instinct that what we could do, this was now several years back, was that what we could do was actually essentially, I don't mean literally, but sniff data out of sewage, our pee and our poop. And if so, we could understand the, the state of community health in neighborhoods, maybe flu, maybe other things. Eventually they decide uh, after talking to uh, one of these mayors, um, actually opioids. What we could do is figure out the prevalence of opioid use in communities uh, so that we could help them um, remediate before people die, before they overdose, not after. And I think it's such a striking example because the probability approach is, oh, we just wait till overdoses happen or 911 calls happen and then we learn about this. And the possibility approach is actually, what could we learn from sewage? Now think about how unlikely that is. What were they told? You'll never get access to the sewage. If you get access to the sewage, you'll never get insight from it. If you get insight from it, you'll never be able to persuade anybody to it. Um, and what happened? No, uh, mayors uh, here in Boston, not, not the one I worked for after, so I claim no involvement with this at all, uh, allow them to try it in, in Boston. Uh, Cary, North Carolina explores this uh, for their use. Um, and then what happens is, is, COVID, is COVID strikes and and, and oh, we can actually use this to test for the prevalence of COVID in, in wastewater. And they, be, they were one of the pioneers of this technique, especially when testing wasn't prevalent otherwise. And so I, I think it's such a powerful example of, of the probability contrast and the, and the possibility contrast. And by the way, of private partners, you know, they run a private company now um, and the public working together, public leaders working together. A, a second example, um, somewhat controversial, uh, I'll stick with COVID for a second and then move on. I write about length in the book is the attempts in Singapore uh, to beat back COVID uh, starting late January when the first case arrives there. And I chronicled uh, an eight week um, race to build a, the first, the world's first nationwide Bluetooth based contact tracing app. And uh, people have their own views about digital contact tracing and the risks of privacy and surveillance. But to me, what's incredibly striking about this is at the same time that, that Singapore unrolls their whole probability apparatus, everything they knew from MERS and SARS and should be tried, human-led contact tracing, quarantining, isolation. Jason Bay, who was running GovTech, uh, Singapore, digital service, uh, 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 the digital service uh, part of GovTech Singapore, their big digital transformation agency, says, hey, I seem to remember there was an idea from a high schooler, a sophomore in Virginia during Ebola um, about this Bluetooth for, 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 for pandemics and maybe we should try it. What an amazing example of opening up your ideas to outsiders that in the midst of the pandemic, you're gonna actually harken back to what some sophomore in high school conjured up um, and, and also some computer scientists and some white papers. This, out, this thinking outside of the, the expertise, I know there's been such, such um, a return to expertise of late on COVID and, and the scientists and the public health experts and I want that, I respect it, but we do also need to invite outsiders and their ideas. And I think the Trace Together example is a frankly example of that. Just one last one. I write in the book about uh, Melvin Carter, the mayor of, of um, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, among other things, he's trying to reinvent, if you will, uh, public safety in his city. He is the first black mayor of St. Paul elect elected to help bring uh, more equity to his city. Um, public safety is uh, high on his agenda. By the way, his father was a police officer. Um, before and after George Floyd is, is killed in the city next door, timely topic. Melvin Carter is, is um, avowed about reforming public safety in his city to make it more effective and more equal. And what does he say, Beth? 
um, when he announces that they're going to start a bunch of new efforts, he says, not all these efforts are going to work. Not all these efforts are going to work. Really, on public safety? Really, after all this has happened? Yes, because he's reckoning with the public about what um, the reality of this is, of doing new things is. If we don't want to keep doing it the way we've been doing it for 30 years, if we are not happy with those outcomes, we need to change. And not all of it will work, but some of it will. And so I think he's a great example. I think, you know, Mariana and, and Nusha um, and these cities, because it's a great example of the partnership that we need. And Trace Together, it's a great example of looking to outsiders for ideas. Here, it's a great example of being candid about what a, a tri-culture is going to be like um, in government. Some, some of the stories in the book, there are others. I won't go on and on. Oh, we do. We do want you to go on and on, but please weave in some more stories as um, as we're going along, and and we'll start to also weave in people's questions in just a moment. I want to ask you though on this note, just to connect on a theme. Uh, some people may have been here for an earlier talk that we did um, with with a investigative reporter from ProPublica, focused on um, the greater use of McKinsey during the pandemic. So ProPublica has been writing a lot of pieces about uh, how, for example, in the first four months of the pandemic, state government spent, um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna remember, the, I'm gonna forget the number now, but it's a really, really big number. Uh, I'm gonna say $100 million on McKinsey services. If I'm, I, I'm at, it's a, a, I see names of people who were here at both talks who are gonna correct whatever the number is that I'm failing to remember right now. But as you're talking about being open to voices from outside, as you're talking about more entrepreneurialism, uh, if I can put you on the spot here a little bit, we haven't talked about this at all, but I'm curious whether you see this move towards bringing in outside consultants, um, bringing in outside entrepreneurs, as how do we square that in some sense with um, creating and investing in talent in government and shoring up the um, capacity of government rather than undermining it? Well, I saw that talk um, that, that you did and I read those articles and I agreed with the basic um, thesis, which is that, uh, that our, we are over-reliant on outsiders because we've under-invested in internal capacity. Okay, so I believe that deeply, that we need much more um, uh, essentially uh, innovation capacity, problem solving capacity inside governments at the federal, state, local level than we have today. And I think that story was emblematic of it. I think frankly, uh, for all that we've seen um, get done during COVID, uh, we are not as agile as we could have been if we had our own skills and talent. Um, you know, I think we look to the vaccine rollout and, and see how hard it was to get these Websites stood up, it shouldn't have been. There are many reasons for that. One of them is we just don't have the talent, the talent developed yet inside government to mainly make that work well. And uh, so, and I think we must, I think we must. I think one of the great, important, urgent lessons of this moment is we should build up um, this possibility skill set inside government. Now, I wanna be clear, um, there are amazing workers right now and you, you work with many people, you lead them, Beth, inside all levels of government um, who do have this mindset and skill set, but they're waiting in many cases for an invitation, for permission to be able to come out of the woodwork and, and, and suggest their new ideas and, and produce novelty. And so the first step is not going to grab a bunch of outsiders. The first step is welcoming the insiders out. That's the first step. But at the same time, we can recognize there is a possibility toolkit that we, we do need more of inside uh, public agencies, and we should find ways to attract that into government, whether it's data scientists, software engineers, product managers, people you know, seasoned in uh, user-centered design. We need those things too in government. And so I think we can go try to track some of that outside talent. And actually, I think it'd be better if we had more of it in-house. In so mostly I think we should build up some capacity inside uh, by attracting insiders out and by attracting outsiders in, I think we'd be much better off. And then having done that, having built up the possibility mindset inside, yes, we can partner with outsiders, but we'll partner with them more on a level playing field. We'll, um, we'll work with GovTech startups and otherwise um, uh, in ways that are, are much more functional and much more expert. And so, so I think you raise a great question, Beth, and my, my answer is we need considerably more possibility skill, uh, my, uh, skill set um, investment than we have, we have made. We, we, that is a lesson of this moment. So in terms of the, the training that new, creating that new skill set and creating the, the people who are trained in possibility government, 
Um, is that what you're doing in the public entrepreneurship program at Harvard Business School? You know, this book it really grows out of this singular experiment that you've been engaged in developing Harvard uh, Business School case studies around these GovTech entrepreneurs um, teaching in this space. Uh, it, I think it might be helpful, especially we have a number of people. I see Anita McGain here uh, at Rotman and Frank Rimolovsky is here from NYU's entrepreneurship program. Love to hear about uh, what, what the public entrepreneurship program looks like. Uh, what was the genesis behind that and how it relates to the um, the ideas in the book? So the genesis was that I ran into uh, the dean, the then dean of, of Harvard Business School um, uh, um, after my mayor, uh, Mayor Menino had announced he wasn't gonna run for a fifth term in office. And, and, and the dean asked if I was gonna run for mayor. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> he said, what are you gonna do? And I said, I said a version of this. I said, look, um, we had a, all this invention and entrepreneurship inside city government. Um, I saw so much opportunity from it. I also saw how hard it was. And I, I know one reason why it's hard, not the only reason why it's hard, but it's this, which is that at policy schools, I think we take all sorts of people who want to go into government and we mostly, and maybe I'm being a little bit extreme here, but I, I hope that's okay. And I don't think so actually. And we mostly train them to be analysts and strategists and not inventors and builders. And when we need analysts and strategists in government, we need inventors and builders too. And at, at, at Harvard Business School, where we have people who are inclined to want to invent and build, we are not telling them you can uh, invent and build for government in the form of these gov tech startups and otherwise, or in government. And we could do that. And so he, he basically said a version of, yeah, come do that here. And so in 2014, I joined the Harvard Business School faculty in 2000 and uh, late that year piloted uh, this course with four sessions uh, and then launched it in earnest in 2015 for our MBAs, uh, our second year MBAs, a course on public entrepreneurship. That's about half uh, about GovTech startups. Um, that's half about uh, these inventors actually inside government, places like places you know, Beth, at Lab CDMX in Mexico City, yes, at Newer Mechanics, at the Innovation Office in Singapore, at the US Digital Service. Um, cases on places like, you know, someday we'll write a case on, on, on the effort you started in New Jersey. So it's about half and half and, um, and as well all the way around the world. And the students come from experiences in the White House or city governments or state governments or the government of India or the UK, and they may be going in that direction, or they might be coming from Amazon or Facebook or Google or some venture capital firm and thinking, ha, huh, I want to work on even bigger problems, the ones that matter more. Um, so that's uh, how, the, how the course came about. And now we teach uh, versions of it to executives. Uh, we teach it to these mayors uh, in partnership with, with the Harvard Kennedy School and Mike Bloomberg's philanthropy. Um, every, every summer training mayors and their senior teams all, all year round training teams on innovation and entrepreneurship. And um, I, I can't pretend that on our own, we're going to bring about more of a possibility mindset in governments around the world and by their partners outside. But I do think the work you're doing, the work happening here, the work happening in so many other universities will help. And, um, and, and, and over time, we could actually arrive at a, at a different mindset as it relates to uh, uh, leading in public. And that's the effort I'm, I'm hoping to contribute to with this, with this work at Harvard Business School. And for, for those who teach, I mean, I will say, yes, I've written two dozen case studies now on episodes like this around the world. And if you're ever interested in, in hearing how those go or seeing any of them uh, or using them in your course, uh, or how the book might fit in the course, like definitely feel free to reach out. So I want to just bring, uh, ask uh, two, one or two last questions. I, I we want to hear from the rest of the group. Um, you have two kind of related comments on the course. So let me just quickly fold those in. Ronnie Rosenberg is asking you in the chat whether you partner with the design school at Harvard and whether you join forces at all with Mariana Mazzucato or Kate Raway. So let me quickly bring those in because those are directly on the question of how you're teaching public entrepreneurship. And then I'll uh, ask one or two more questions and then we'll go over to our illustrious guests here. So on the design school question, I confess I have not really, I have this an ambition that someday we would do much better uh, with that. I have had students from the design school uh, from, from the GSD come and, and take the course and they've been great contributors. And the whole first part of the course is about, um, I'm not trying to be over, over simplistic here and, and say this is all what the design school is, but the first part of the course is about ideas and generating ideas and does borrow from some concepts of design and design thinking 
Um, and so, um, no, I haven't partnered, um, but um, actually, but, but maybe spiritually to some extent, yes. Um, and then Mariana Mazzucato, I mean, I have not partnered with her, but I mean, I write about her in the book. I think her arguments about, um, about government actually being much more innovative than people uh, ever give it credit for, obliterating the myth that government is the state um, and backwards uh, you know, partner in the public private has been so essential. And, um, and so I, uh, I, I hope this book is a compliment actually to the entrepreneurial state. And now she's out with her new book um, and it's very much about public entrepreneurship and the need for government to be innovative. So I hope these are a piece, I mean, Beth, your book, um, I mean, like if, if, if we, you know, there's, there's one or two other books out there now in the same direction, like there's, there's a possibility that there's a movement really truly afoot here. Between all the uh, work ha happening in academia on this front, um, in, in the way Beth, you're contributing and Mariana, and, and I hope I can make some contribution here and others. Uh, and, and then in addition, um, all the work that's happening in governments. Um, like there's a chance that we've never really pulled off possibility government, at least not in a couple hundred years, um, but we, we might be able to now. It helps if I unmute myself. Um, so on that note, uh, talking about now and this moment in time, we've talked about, you know, not wasting a good crisis and how COVID has propelled things forward. Lots of, obviously there's, there's lots of momentum in the space at the same time, January 6th, the apotheosis of a, uh, descent into hyper-partisanship that's been going on since Newt Gingrich. Um, that Ezra Klein and others have written so eloquently about sort of the what divides us rather than what holds us together. Are you optimistic about our ability to do any of this in such a hyperpartisan climate? Um, so optimism, I don't want to paper over how perilous things are. Um, I do actually worry quite a bit about the state of our democracy. Um, and, and so, I don't want to paper over that, but I will say that I think in, in some way, uh, possibility government could be an antidote to some of that. I, I don't want to oversimplify either, but, I, but um, uh, you know, to some extent, what we have in, in the hyper-partisanship is, is I've got my ideas and you've got your ideas and never the two shall meet. And by the way, we'll never meet either anymore. And what I think the methods of possibility government offer us is actually a way to say, look, you have your ideas, I have my ideas, why don't we start to test them both and we'll just see which one works out better. I know that seems like woeful and naive in this day and age, but, but wouldn't it be better if we, if in every issue, it didn't always boil down to ideology, but instead boiled down to experimentation evidence. And so I think, especially at the city and state level where things may be more doable, I think that, that this can be an antidote to, to some of that. Um, in addition to the trust deficit that's been built up, I mean, people don't trust government for a lot of reasons. By the way, as you all, this is pervasive, right? Uh, more than half the people in developed countries um, around the world don't trust their federal government. This is not a narrow or recent phenomenon, um, although it's a contemporary one. Um, why don't they trust their governments? Uh, multi, uh, you know, multifaceted reasons for that. But, but one reason is that they, they look around them and they see the problems really, really facing that haven't been solved. And so I, I do think, and maybe again, I hope this doesn't sound naive, but I am optimistic that we could actually get to problem solving and we could actually build up back more of that trust. And in addition, by the way, this goes back to my point about Melvin Carter, if we were honest with the people about what this is all gonna take, then they might trust us more too. We all have this instinct in public life, which is to promise people success, tell them they got success, they know better. And so I, I, I know we're living in a hyper-partisan moment and a very, uh, a moment of a huge trust deficit. I am though, hopeful Beth, that there are there is some way still out of it. And then by the way, on the question of democracy writ large, um, I just that think- That was what I was, I was about to, I was about to close out with asking you, so I'm glad you reminded me of what we were going to talk about, which was really what this means for democracy too. I, I think the way through is to, is to reinvent our way through. I mean, one response to the sixth and all the stuff that led up to it and everything since is to say, oh my God, our democracy is so fragile that do not touch it, don't experiment on it, um, and, um, and, and, and don't try to do anything new. And I just think that'd be the wrong instinct. I understand that instinct. But, but I actually believe that we've got to, 
if, if we acquire these skills of public entrepreneurship and a possibility of government, that perhaps the place to, to most responsibly, but most energetically devote them to is to actually re refurbishing our democracy. I write in the book about, um, about you know, just one, one effort, uh, Vote Shield, which is an effort by some, some people you may be familiar with to uh, some lawyers, election lawyers, uh, a technologist, to basically build some technology that can, that can look for, say, uh, aberrations in voter registration lists. Right? So one of the easiest ways, maybe not easiest, but one of the most um, systematic ways to disrupt a vote would be to quietly sneak into the, the voter registration list and change everybody's address from 10 Main Street to 100 Main Street. They show up at their voting, their, their polling place. No, you're in the wrong place. They, they go home and they don't vote. If you do that in the right places enough, you could change the outcome of a vote. And so a piece of technology to basically detect when that's happening, whether it's a cybersecurity incursion, whether it's a, a purposeful purge, like dozens of other efforts, I think we need like that in order to expand the vote, make the vote fair, uh, all this worry about disinformation. I mean, you, the, the response could be that all this invention has got made us this, in this mess. And certainly invention has, has gotten us in this mess, but I, I also think invention is gonna get us out of it. And so I, I hope this is a moment for a lot of public entrepreneurship, a lot of uh, uh, democracy entrepreneurship. And so last uh, question for me on this front is just the policy prescriptions. Uh, so there's a bubbling up of experimentation, of innovation that you describe, all of these wonderful stories. Uh, what is it that you want a Biden administration to do? What is it that you want a mayor to do? Uh, who, are, who, who needs to do what in order to go from possibility government being a possibility to being the, um, the, the kind of modus operandi for how we do things on a, uh, as, the, as the new normal? Well, um, it's a very fair question. I, I, um, and it's not like they don't all uh, have a lot on their hands. <laughs> Um, so at the, at the, at the presidential level, um, I will say one thing, which is, um, this is, isn't quite yet a policy, although I will answer your policy question, which is I took note. So the night, I don't know if you noticed, but the night Biden declares victory that Saturday in November, November 7th, he gets on that stage in Delaware and he says, uh, he says, you could always define America by one word. And the one word he says is possibilities. That's like a lot to put on one word. And then again, on inauguration day, that night, he's swearing in his team and says the same exact thing. You've always been able to uh, define um, uh, uh, America with one word, that word is possibilities. So what does he mean? So maybe he's just gesturing towards hopefulness and optimism uh, in the future. That would certainly be um, in keeping with so much of what our presidents have said and done. I hope what he means, and I guess, this is inching towards the direction of policy recommendation, which is that he's gonna be explicit with his team. He wants his team to be explicit with us that this means trying things that um, might only work. In the early days, the first 100 days here, they're so focused on a return to competence and I get that. And I don't, I don't disagree with that. Um, and I think it's good, but I hope as we, as we move forward, right past 100 days, maybe he'll say the next 100 ways, right? I want new and novel proposals for all the big problems that face us. And so that is a way to set a culture of possibility within the administration. I hope he'll do that. At the policy level, I think at the state, uh, city, state, and federal level, there are two big systems which will ultimately need to change if we're going to do this um, writ large. And one goes back to the talent question you raised earlier. Uh, uh, we do need to find ways to better promote and develop people with these skill sets and invite them in. And then we also need, I mean, your, your office is an example of this. I know the work you've done to, to be able to bring in new roles, literally new roles into the New Jersey government. We are going to need to actually change the way we hire um, in government and um, to bring some of this talent in and fund it more. The second system is around budgeting and procurement. For the most part today, it is very hard to buy and budget for possibility. For the most part, it's obviously much easier uh, to basically write these long RFPs uh, try to buy certainty. We're fooling ourselves when we say that. There have been movements uh, in this country otherwise afoot to change that, make it easier to buy in smaller chunks, maybe easier to try before we buy. Uh, as I write about in the book, James Gertz, who uh, tried to revolutionize some of the procurement efforts at, at, at the U.S. Special Operations Command, he calls it moving from require to acquire to acquire to require, right? Let's get some stuff in our hands, try it out, see what it does. We are going to need to change those systems. So I would make if, if, if uh, 
if public leaders are looking for how to instantiate possibility of government more broadly, I would say look at your policies around talent, look at your policies around budgeting and procurement. We're going to need to undertake changes in both. So what we do now to make our virtual room a little more intimate is to let people ask their questions in person. Um, so we're gonna, uh, I wanna encourage people who have questions, comments uh, to please uh, let us know through hand raising electronically, through letting us know on Twitter, through posting in the Q and A or in the chat. Uh, and we'll promote you to ask your question uh, of Mitch directly. And I think it makes it a little more conversational. And to that end, let me go over to Daniel and uh, let him ask you uh, uh, his question. Hi, thank you so much for the space and for the, for the talk. And um, as someone who has worked in government, has tried and su succeeded and both failed to push these kinds of innovations, how can government retain, bring in and retain this talent that you, the, that we recognize that it needs? Do you want uh, to introduce yourself first, just to, just to create the context? Yes, sorry. I'm Daniel Broyd. I'm a PhD student in public administration at NYU Wagner. And where in government, if you don't mind saying, where did you try and fail at this? We all tried and failed at it, so there's no shame in that. I'm I'm Mexican, so I used to work uh, in different state-owned enterprises in the Mexican federal government. Great. Well, thanks for the question, Daniel. Um, so attracting and retaining talent. Um, so I believe deeply that we need to make a commitment to the people we're going to try to bring in that you will get to solve problems. And we have to live up to that that if you wanna attract these engineers who like solving things, you wanna attract people who have outside options where they're gonna get paid more, um, equity, all sorts of other stuff. The thing those places don't have that government has is we will let you work on the world's biggest problems, the most important problems. And the thing we haven't done yet is, is enough, is, is actually allowed them to make progress on them. If we bring people in and we move faster and we use this toolkit to do that, then I believe they will stay because they'll see the fruits of their labor. They don't want to come in and spend two, three, four, five years to wait. Hopefully, maybe someday my intervention will make some difference. But if they can see early on that they've solved a problem around vaccine distribution or on school enrollment um, or around housing mobility, they will, they will catch the bug and they want to do more and more. And so I think actually getting, essentially getting to, to output earlier, it's not, I'm not saying move fast, break things, but, but get to some output earlier that helps humans, I do think that's a big part of the retention problem here. And that's the advice I give to public leaders. If you've brought these people in and you wanna keep them, empower them to solve something um, and rather quickly. Um, in terms of attracting them in the first place, I think it's, a, it's, the, it's the same basic promise, which is we will allow you to, uh, to work on big problems. We will help you, uh, you, help you uh, make progress. You'll help us make progress. Um, I think that we do need to create some new roles to attract them into. We might have to redefine some roles. Um, I am sort of, I do find, uh, I think, I forget, Beth, if on your team, you hired one of your first product managers, but I do think that's an appealing role for some people. Um, mm -hmm. By the way, we can go to young people. I, I love what, say, uh, uh, Chris Kwong and Rachel Doyle have done at Coding It Forward here in the US to attract college students to say, hey, you're interested in, in you're, you're, you're going to get a degree in computer science. Where do you want to go take that degree? Go take it into public stuff. They give them summer fellowships, expose them to what it's like to work in government. So I think the other way to attract these people is to give them some exposure, give them a trial at it, let them see. The thing I hear most, Daniel, and I'm sure you heard this too, from my students who wonder if they should go into government, they ask me again and again, will I be able to make a difference? If we can prove that to them, they will come and they will stay. So I'm going to uh, uh, encourage more people to please chime in and uh, uh, with their comments, with their questions. But in the meantime, let me, uh, oh, oh wait, oh good, Jonathan Brown, please. We'll promote you if you're talkable. Uh, if we wanna, let's see, allow to, oops, where did you go? I'm gonna, there we go. Jonathan, please. Uh, yeah, thanks, this is great. I'm a uh, um, retired public servant from the Ontario Ministry of Education. Um, we're supposed to be catching up to Americans in terms of entrepreneurship. And um, our motto in our government is uh, um, 
peace, order, and good government. That's in our constitution. So uh, here's my question. In my role as a public servant and talking to young people that are going into government these days, for example, we do have a, an Ontario digital service and they're doing some amazing things uh, very quickly with the uh, user interface and um, GitHub, Gov and things like that. But there are entrenched in the Ontario public servant uh, CIOs, these are IT clusters. And I remember working on a project so that when we were consolidating eight, web, eight databases, legacy databases into one web service, the project people came in, we had to extract the knowledge from the ones running the legacy systems. And the legacy, we had to bring in a consultant to deal with the conflict between the project people and the ones that were running the legacy system we were doing a brain dump, but they knew that then they would have to compete for the new jobs. So uh, when I put this question to the, um, this young team, they said, well, yeah, this is our big problem. We can do things at the edge of big government, but getting big government to come on board, it's almost like that, you know, the, the trim rudder that turns the big rudder. Um, have you, are you seeing any in the COVID recovery, I, uh, and I'm jumping all over the place, but New York City just issued a uh, social bond and I was in part of that uh, group doing their webinar. And it was amazing because they actually had people down at the community roots level with lots of volunteer connect work networks and they were being told, okay, you need to apply for this uh, social bond that New York was issuing. And, and, but the discussion was right down at the frontline worker level. And that's what I see missing in a lot of the open government initiatives inside of the government itself. Do you want to comment on, on that or any other use cases where you're bringing that entrepreneurship from the front line inside government? Sure. So, um, so Jonathan, great to meet you. And by the way, um, actually there's been some, um, what you described happening in, in, in Ontario and in Canada is actually a very common phenomenon which is you have pockets of this and it hasn't spread all over the place. And so um, that's what I see everywhere. And, and by the way, the United States is not on the front end of this anymore. Um, there are many other countries all around the world who are, uh, who are quite uh, entrepreneurial innovative and actually many Canadian cities. I've had the pleasure of meeting many of your mayors. And so don't feel uh, like you have to, uh, you know, um, gesticulate this direction. I mean, uh, uh, we all have a lot to learn from each other. Um, but so, okay, so there's a couple things that you mentioned, I guess I want to touch on. So there is this issue of uh, how special is this set of possibility practices? Is it just a few people who are hived off in some special little lab? And how much is it, uh, is it really spread throughout, throughout the organization? This is, this, this is one of the most seminal issues in all of um, innovation generally, public, private, organizational behavior. You know, should we keep this thing separate or should we, but then it's only going to be some few people do we bring it inside and, and there'll be many more people, but it might get killed by the existing bureaucracy and the weight of the existing administration. And so I, I write about in the book, I think what we need is basically ambidextrous government, ambidextrous government. And this is, this is a riff on a, a concept from a colleague of mine, Michael Tushman, his co-author, Charles O'Reilly. When they talk about really um, ambidextrous organization, ambidextrous leaderships, ones that as James March uh, once said, can explore the future um, and exploit the present all at the same time. We need government that can exploit the present and explore the future all at the same time. We do need the pieces that sort of do what normally gets done. And, um, and we can't have uh, basically our city governments, our state governments, our regional governments, our provincial governments uh, focused on innovation in the future all the time. We cannot. I think it's a mistake, actually, a mistake to wander in as a mayor or a minister or whatever and a governor and say, we're all innovators now. I think, it's, I think it's actually a mistake. Um, and so the trick is, how do you create some separation uh, at, the, uh, at the outset so that the entrepreneurial stuff can, 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 can gestate at the same time as you basically bring it into the organization, make sure it's connected to the organization, make sure it's not just a bunch of special people hived off in a special office. And um, there are techniques for that. Um, in, in the book, as I mentioned, I write about James Gertz who tried this at the US Special Operations Command starts off base in a former tattoo parlor, right? Separate physically, separate emotionally, separate financially, doesn't give them a penny, 
out of his multi-billion dollar budget at the Special Operations Command to get going. But it's, it's very, very separate at first. And some people think, well, too separate, too special. But over time, they build pathways, connections from, you know, you're talking about the little rudder to the big rudder, you know, from, the, from this remote part to the mothership, whatever the metaphor you want. I believe we need ambidextrous government, future-oriented parts, present-oriented parts. Sometimes, off, more often than not, they need to start separately. And over time, we need to build pathways, uh, the relationships and the financial pathways to, 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 to carry the work from side to side. The needs from the big part to the novel part, the products from the novel part to the big part. Um, so, I, so I would say that's the, that's the way we, we go about it. And that's the riddle of these digital services, the offices like Beth's leading, that, that's the riddle they're trying to navigate. Um, in terms of the frontline user, I'll just say a quick word about that because I know um, I've gone on a bit, but, but uh, absolutely part of this has got to be going to the workers for their own ideas, right? The whole, the whole first part of a possibility apparatus is we need government that can imagine. Where are you going to get new ideas? From users, citizens, from outsiders. We talked about the sophomore in high school from uh, open data and other things like that. I mean, that's one of the world's experts on, on accessing the crowd for help here. But in addition, from the frontline workers, they have to be enlisted in this. Um, and uh, look, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Von Hippel has all this research that says, you know, something like 80% of the uh, innovation in scientific instruments was by the people who were using them, <laughs> right? Like the, the, the frontline government worker does have um, a, a, uh, a rich plenitude of ideas to provide here, and we do need to access them. So I, I, I like uh, that part of what you said. Can we bring in, do you pronounce it Nika? Nika Sobers who has a question and a hand raised. Yes, thank you. My name is Nika. Thanks. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Nika and I'm actually a product manager currently at New York City Planning Labs. Um, so your talk definitely really resonated with me. Um, but a little before my time at Planning Labs, I actually had studied urban planning. You know, I studied, got a degree at Virginia Tech, MIT. I was definitely ready to work in public government as a city planner. But you're right, I felt like through my education, I feel like the only options that I had available were to be an analyst. And I knew that wasn't exactly the capacity or the role I wanted to have in city government. Uh, but it really wasn't until I formally co-founded a civic tech startup that I started to reframe some of the skills that I had gained as a planner as an entrepreneur. <laughs> I actually now, um, you know, I was, do you mean a lot of the similar things that I've done in planning school, but it was framed a little differently when I started running a company that was trying to um, actually create a bartering tool for community uh, communities to create their own infrastructure projects. So my question was uh, actually about how, what are your thoughts or how can we move forward in trying to um, not only broaden the types of people who we can attract into government um, to create the possibilities we want, but actually helping them reframe some of their skills, especially if they're coming from very different backgrounds that they don't conventionally see as entrepreneurial. Oh, I love that question, Nika. So wait, what is the name of this thing you co-founded or is it the thing that you're at now? Uh, sorry, the, the uh, company that I co-founded is no longer, but we uh, were incubated in MIT's Delta V program. It was called ah. Swapple. Okay, so yeah, so I don't know if you ran across um, Nusha when she was at Delta V twice, actually, once with Biobot yes. and once with something else. Um, it was the year after Biobot, yeah. Oh, okay, the year after Biobot. Okay, well, very neat. So look, I, I love your question. So uh, how do we reframe? So one thing is, 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 let's start with this word you mentioned so many times we've talked about today, entrepreneurship. So we have a definition at Harvard Business School from Howard Stevenson of entrepreneurship that I think helps people see themselves in a new way see themselves as an entrepreneur if they hadn't before. Okay, so Stevenson's definition of entrepreneurship and now ours is this. Entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources currently controlled. The pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled. Why is that so important? Well, first of all, it says nothing in there about entrepreneurs and people who start companies. Why is that important? Because you can be an entrepreneur even if you're not at a company. You can be an entrepreneur even if you didn't start the thing. It's about a mindset, he says. Okay, so what's the mindset? It's this pursuit of opportunity beyond resources currently controlled. It's behavioral. What does that mean? What is it in contrast to? He says mostly, mostly what administrative managers do by contrast is they look at the resources they have at hand and they try to wring the most out of those. 
and doesn't that describe what we do in government so much? And by the way, I understand why, right? We're, we're professional bureaucrats. We're meant to be efficient. That's our responsibility. But we look at the resources, the programs, the people we have, and we try to make uh, the most of them. And Stevenson says, just look, if you're an entrepreneurial manager, you do the opposite. You look out of the world, you look at its problems, you say, I'm going to marshal the resources towards those problems. And Nika, I think that is a way of helping people reframe. If they say, I, I know I'm sitting in this government job, but I feel this, 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 I, I, I feel imaginative. I feel like I, can, I, I feel like there's problems in the world I want to solve. You can say, yes, you can be an entrepreneur too. You can be an entrepreneur too. Your task now is to say, okay, how do I bring resources to that problem? As opposed to how do I take the program I'm running and make it, you know, 20, 20% more efficient. So, um, so many people who don't think of themselves as entrepreneurs should or could, if we invite it to the mat. I think that is, uh, is, very much the, is very much the first step. Wonderful. Um, with that said, I think we are uh, amazingly almost out of time here. So I'll do a quick canvas. Let me just look around electronically and otherwise I see uh, friends of yours who have who've been in the room and are out of the room. Thanks for putting that up. I want to encourage people to go out and buy We The Possibility. I'm also going to check on Twitter for a second and see if there is anything going on there by way of questions. Um, but I think the way I would encourage people at this late hour to get their questions answered is by reading the book. Um, and apropos of the discussion about talent and what government needs to do better to become more capable and competent, let me announce two events coming up. One is on May the 6th, that's uh, gonna be around the corner now. We have Paul Light from Wagner. Um, the NYU Wagner School and the Brookings Institution talking about government reform and what to do to make government. He's really doing the, the, um, the, the, he's the, he's the opposite side of we, the possibility. He's all the failures, all the things that are going wrong, but we need, in some ways we should have had him come talk before you to really talk about all the challenges and why we so much need uh, the possibilities that you're talking about. And then we will announce at a future point a date uh, for an event we're doing with the Partnership for Public Service, very much focused on these questions of strategies for bringing in more talent into government um, in an effort both to uh, restore faith in government and as a result to strengthen our democracy. So I wanna thank everybody uh, for joining us both here in, the per in person, if you will, in person, and um, very much uh, for the people also who joined us on the web who reflect a much bigger group. Uh, we are very glad to have all of you here and we're very grateful to Mitch Weiss for joining us to share his new book. Congratulations, we're glad you got to celebrate together with us and uh, share with us We the Possibility. I encourage people again to, uh, um, to uh, go out and grab it. And what we'll do is we will end the live stream in just a minute and we will, Mitch and I will stick around for a moment for those people who are in the room or if you're on Twitter and wanna join us in the room, we'll promote everybody to participate and see if there are any lurking secret unanswered questions that people did not have a chance to ask. I know it's uh, the pandemic is, it doesn't, you know, all of us are tired on being on Zoom for too long. So, um, uh, uh, we don't want to obligate anybody to stay, but Mitch and I will stick around for a few minutes to see if there are any an unanswered questions. With that, let me thank the Institute for Public Knowledge and the GovLab for hosting the Future of Democracy lecture series, and we look forward to seeing you with Paul Light on May 6th. Thank you again to Mitch Weiss for joining us, and we'll see you next time. And for those who are in the room, we'll end the stream.